living your story right now in this moment. You know, no two stories are alike. We are all unique. We all have a different lens through which we see the world. We all have something to contribute, to share, to be. That uniqueness takes courage. It's not easy to stand in your truth. It's not easy to let yourself be vulnerable, to be really seen, to be really heard. So many of us hide. So many of us stay hidden. So many of us make the choice to step forward, to own who we are, to own our stories, to share our voice. The tide is turning. We're moving into a space of deeper vulnerability, courage, authenticity, and love. We're moving closer to greater self-love, self-acceptance, honesty, and empowerment. To get there, to get to that space, means we have to authentically share who we are. It means we have to authentically show up as our true selves. The magic is in sharing who you are. The magic is in sharing your story. That's where this series comes in. Own your voice. Love yourself. Stay true to your story. Dive deep into your vulnerability. Shine in your authenticity. Once you do, there's no stopping you. Stay honest. Stay brave. Stay true to who you are. Welcome to Seek the Joy Podcast, the power of storytelling. My name is Amber Camille Ligon, and I am a podcast host, producer, writer, and consultant. When I was a child growing up in my abusive household, I knew there was something better out there waiting for me. I knew that when I had the chance to build my own life, I would really make it something special and something different than what I saw at home growing up. There was a lot of trauma and not very much love in my house as a kid. We were taught to fend for ourselves. And when it came time to get attention, I did what I did best. I performed. I performed plays and monologues. I rehearsed jokes and choreographed routines. Whatever I could do to lighten the mood and bring a smile to my mom's face. This was my lifeline, and it made me feel like I had some control in my world of chaos. At 16, I moved out to live on my own, and at 17, I went to college. I enrolled in a private university in Fort Worth, Texas, where everything and everyone was a far cry from anything I had ever seen before. There were rich kids everywhere. Money, nice cars, nice clothes, things I had only seen on television or in movies. Soon, I made friends and I changed. I made a conscious decision to change. I transformed myself to become more like the rich kids I knew at school. I pretended like I came from money, even though I did not. I pretended my family had wealth and nice cars and multiple homes. They did not. I painted a fake picture of who I was and where I came from, an effort to fit in, but I still stuck out like a sore thumb. The first problem was my hair. I'm half black and half white, and my hair doesn't know which side to join. My curly hair attracted attention I did not want, prompting people to ask me questions like, what are you? 
Most of the kids at this school were white, and I was their first mixed-race person to ever encounter. When you are trying to fit in, this is not ideal. Over time, I began to blend in more. I took out mounds of student loan debt to accomplish this. I bought a new car, new clothes, and worked two jobs while going to school so I could keep up with the elite student body. And I loved this. No one knew where I came from, and I could build a brand new Amber from the ground up. A new Amber who hung around rich kids and vacationed in Aspen. I thought this was the better version of me. I was embarrassed by where I came from and wanted to eliminate any trace of my former self. So I did. I became a rich kid from a family of privilege and carried out my life as if this were true. After I graduated, I started working in the fashion industry, first retail and then buying and apparel design. I loved every inch of the fashion industry and its elitist pretension and judgmental character and superficiality. I was all about looks and money and status and ego. The fashion industry was a perfect place to flex the skills I had honed in college. And I achieved some success. I became a buyer for a major retailer. I traveled all around the country in a private jet. And I designed custom evening gowns for wealthy clients. I worked long hours and was 100% dedicated to my career. I was committed to becoming the person I had designed in my college years. I had a vision of myself as a Devil Wears Prada kind of CEO who called the shots for a major fashion brand and who everyone else looked up to and idolized. I wanted to prove to my family and to myself that I mattered, that I did something special, that I was special. I searched constantly for this validation. I thought of what other people thought of me every second of every day, from the time I got dressed in the morning until the time I went to sleep. I needed constant validation. And I got it. I got promoted. I got a raise. I got a new job and bought a brand new Mercedes Benz. I became the boss, a leader, and was hired to fix organizations who needed my specific industry expertise. I thought I was untouchable. I had worked so hard to become someone else that I even convinced myself. Then tragedy struck. I lost my high-paying job, and when I couldn't find a new job, I lost my car, I lost my friends, and I lost most of my belongings. I had to sell everything in order to pay my rent, and I was almost homeless because at one point I couldn't afford to pay my rent. I needed someone to bail me out. I was dumbfounded. I thought I did everything right. I thought I was working hard and that I was good at what I did. I thought that people would recognize my strengths and would want to reward me and give me a chance. But no one came. No one hired me. And when I looked around at my life, I realized I had so much less than what I thought I had. I had nothing. It was just me and my mess. I applied to over 280 jobs in the Dallas market, and I got nothing. Because I spent my life obsessing over status and owning nice things, I ignored everything else. I ignored my own personal growth and development. I ignored my own faults and flaws I ignored my pain and heartache, and I ignored the love and care that exists in the world. 
I was focused on the wrong things. And losing everything is the only way I was able to realize my shortcomings. So, I did what any desperate millennial does. I searched the internet for answers. And when I didn't find answers there, I started listening to podcasts. I listened to other people share their stories. Stories similar to mine. Stories of trauma, neglect, and abuse. Stories of loss and failure. Stories of evolution and triumph. And it was like the sky opened up and this big, bright light shined down on me and said, here are your answers. This is what you need to do. So I listened and I learned. And when the podcasts weren't enough, I read the books written by the podcast hosts. And then I listened to other podcasts and read the books that the guests wrote. I became engulfed in the style of personal storytelling and vulnerability. People like James Altucher and Josh Waitzkin became my heroes. And I realized that I was not alone, that there were other people out there like me, other people who always dreamed of something bigger and better for themselves, and people who actually made it happen. After I literally spent morning to night listening to podcasts for one solid year, I studied my heroes and began modeling my own life after theirs. I started to take inventory of my own skills and talents. What was I good at that I could market and sell for profit? And how could I start doing it today? I was eager to show the world what I could do. And I began to approach my opportunities with more humility. I started driving for Lyft, and I spent two summers delivering groceries in the hot Texas sun. I became focused on growing and developing my ability to create opportunity by my own design. Rather than leaving my opportunities up to someone else choosing me, I decided to choose myself and create my own opportunity. I decided to become the best person I could be to make my life better and more fulfilled than ever before. This was my second chance. After I realized the person I had become and the error of my ways, at first, I was humiliated. I stayed away from everyone and shut everything out because I was ashamed and embarrassed by my former self and the egotistical, confused, and insecure woman who existed before. But then I realized that I was also similar to all the people who I admire so much on the podcasts I listen to. The other people who have failed and lost and made mistakes and cried and felt hopeless and then reemerged anew and with a more loving, compassionate sense of the world. This realization transformed me into the person I am today. I am not without flaws, that is certain. I am a constant work in progress. But I am a far cry better than the girl I was before. I learned tools and listened to stories, and this healed me and created a path for great and wonderful things to happen in my life. I decided to start my own podcast to share the wisdom and tools we can all use to create meaningful, fulfilled lives. And when I think of my younger self as a child and how I used to imagine a great and beautiful future for myself, I never imagined one thing. I never imagined I could feel this much love and compassion. After losing everything, I had to rely on the kindness of others to survive, to feel empowered and inspired. I am forever grateful for those who have shared their stories to help enlighten others on their path. 
It is my goal and intent to do the same by sharing my story and the stories of others on my podcast, Amber on Podcasts. Writing and producing my podcast has allowed me to hold myself accountable and remind myself of the love and joy and compassion that exists in the world. Also, it is my passion to share information that is helpful for us to lead longer, healthier lives and allow us to live up to our full potential. Today, my work is 100% dedicated to sharing this message of hope and empowerment. I love learning and am constantly on the hunt for new insights. I share as I learn, and I have never felt more empowered and proud in my entire life. Funny enough, after I started podcasting, I started getting job offers regularly. All of a sudden, I would open my email or LinkedIn, and there would be three or four messages a week asking for an interview. I started a new career in consulting, and I'm currently working on building my brand and my platform to help other people, especially women, live more fulfilled lives that are full of love, peace, and joy. We all deserve to live the dream life we imagine. It just depends on if you're actually ready to get up and do it or not. I decided to take my life and my future into my own hands and create the life I want. I used to think life was happening to me. Now I know life is happening for me. The world is brighter. My relationships are better. I have made and saved more money than ever before. And I am happier and more grateful because I listened to podcasts, and because I lost everything. If I can do it, anyone can. Sharing my story has taught me that there is purpose in our pain. That if you can be transparent and real, you can connect with people in a way that can create a positive impact on the world. My biggest dream is to impact as many people as possible, so more people feel less alone, less afraid, and more empowered. So more people realize their strength and power. And so more people can do more good. Hello, beautiful souls. My name is Melissa Bates, and I am a certified eating psychology coach as well as a certified health coach and I look forward to sharing my story with you. Um, My story of how I became a health coach was kind of taking myself back to where I was as a teenager and when I was in 11th grade I developed bulimia and it was more so due to outside sources um, being at school and comparing myself to other people, being teased by other people, as well as even my volleyball coach that told me like, oh, you could be so much faster and better if you just, you know, lost some weight and go, go run some miles. Um, So in my head, I took that information and processed it as I need to lose weight in whatever way I can. And for me, that was turning to bulimia. And in 11th grade, that's when Every night after dinner, I would throw up, and every night after I threw up, I would go run a mile um, just to make sure that no food was in my system, and that's how I thought I would achieve that, the ideal body of, you know, being faster and being a better athlete as well as just being beautiful in the quote-unquote societal standards. Uh, So that kind of took me all the way through to senior year and during senior year I remember I went to throw up one day and I put my head over the toilet and when I went to throw up I didn't even have to put my fingers down my throat it literally just wanted to come up itself and that that scared the crap out of me and that kind of forced me to be like this is this is not the way to go this is not the way to go about you know getting that healthier body. Um, so I didn't 
do any type of healing for my bulimia at that time. Um, I kind of just switched it for working out crazy amounts of hours, like working out in the morning, working out in the evening time, um, as well as dieting and trying to eat as clean as I could. And that followed me into my college years and pretty much from, you know, 18 all the way to 32 years old, I would say I was, I was a hardcore, hardcore chronic dieter. And that's what my life surrounded on. I mean, I had other activities that I got to, but I was always so aware I've of what I was eating, like I wouldn't touch fast food and certain parts of my life to save my life because I was just like, no way, that's not going in my body, that's not healthy, um, I will never achieve my body if I eat anything like that, and I was a very, very, very extremely restrictive individual, and I didn't realize how much it was affecting me and suppressing the power inside of me that I didn't really know existed. Um, but as I was going through my hardcore chronic dieting stages, I would always get so much praise from people like, oh my God, you look so good. Um, you know, you're, you're slimming down really well. And for me, that was just like, okay, I'm doing the right thing. So that gave me fuel, even though I didn't realize how much I was hurting my body. And then it got to a point like different spurts of my chronic dieting my hair would start falling out. And I just thought it was just like, oh, you know, maybe it's something with the water or something like that. But I would have a lot of hair that fell out. And when I look back, I know it was because I was barely eating a thousand calories. Sometimes I remember in college sitting in my car, literally eating a can of tuna and putting hot sauce on it. And that was my meal. And that's insane to be looking back on that. But for me, it was like, I'm eating a minimal amount so that I can achieve this amazing, beautiful, ideal body that the media says is and what everyone needs to look like. And then fast forward to that, uh, when I was about 30, 31, I started um, kind of training towards a bodybuilding competition. And don't get me wrong, even though I had, I used exercise for kind of just like chasing this body. I did learn to love exercise because it taught me a good amount of discipline and it taught me to show up for myself, maybe in not the best ways, but it still taught me to show up for myself. Um, So I love lifting and I still love lifting to this day, but I transitioned dieting into chasing the bodybuilding dream. And once I was deep into chasing that dream, I ended up getting sick. Uh, This is when I was living in South Korea. That was my uh, third year in South Korea. And I ended up getting diagnosed with IBSC. And basically, I had to halt my bodybuilding career. And my my stomach, my, my system, I could barely eat an apple without my system swelling up and being and literally looking like I was like six, seven months pregnant. Um, It was crazy. And it was just the gas within my body that was not being able to evacuate. Um, so for the next year after that, I literally had to stop dieting. I, I could not train for bodybuilding competition because I literally had to train my body how to eat food again. Um, I ended up doing the FODMAP diet, which is more of like an elimination diet where you just take food out of your system and then you slowly incorporate it back in. Um, And that was the only way that I could actually eat because I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was causing it. Once, as I was going through it, there are points where I could literally only eat once a day because my system was such a mess. And I know my system was such a mess due to all the chronic dieting that I did over the years. And when you're able, when you take so many foods out of your body, you're not able to process them anymore. So once you get back to kind of eating things again, it's like, what do you want me to do? Um, And that's what my body was telling me. So I just, I had to listen to it and I had to stop dieting. And then at that point, I probably gained about 30, 30 to 40 pounds within a year, which caused me to have social anxiety. And I didn't even want to see my friends. I didn't want to go outside because I just felt like, I had this 
amazing body, ideal body, but then I lost it all because I got sick and I couldn't deal with that. And I couldn't, I couldn't see beyond that. I couldn't see that I was still this beautiful, amazing human that has love to offer the world. All I could see was this body that was not the body that I desired at all. And kind of taking that year to just go through it, I finally got to a point where I was just like, okay, I have to figure out a better way to live, a better way to eat, a better way to take care of myself. And that's when I kind of started tapping into intuitive eating. And intuitive eating literally gave me my life back. And I will say that it it 100% gave me my life back because it gave me the power to see that I am more than a body. I am more than what I put in my mouth. I am more than how many hours I exercise in the gym. And it taught me to appreciate all the things that my body do for me, that my body does for me. And that was able to give me that confidence in my body. And at this point in time, I'm about a size 14. And back in the day, this would be unheard of. I would be so uncomfortable in this body. I would not be confident in this body at all, but I have never been so confident in my life. And I really owe that confidence to taking the time to heal myself. Because also when I got sick, my bulimia as well as my binge eating came came back. So before, as I told you, I kind of just pushed them aside and used other things to cover them. And as they came back, it was the best point for me to literally just dive in and do the work and be aware of the actions that I take for myself as the actions that I take that are harming me and keeping me suppressed. So once I was able to kind of work through that and get to a point of loving myself and everything like that, When I first started, I started off as a weight loss coach, and I immediately knew that helping people lose weight wasn't my main passion, and that's when I shifted over into more of um, intuitive eating coach and helping females heal their relationship with food because I know how much power I got from healing my relationship with food, and I feel like a lot of people don't understand how suppressed you are when you are struggling with that relationship and when I was able to heal my relationship with food I was able to not only show up for myself for my business for the beautiful people around me but I just earned this new energy for life I mean I've always been a happy-go-lucky person but now I feel like the sun is just inside of me and it's shining out to other people if that makes sense to you that is like my kind of my picture of how I was able to change and how I was able to heal and go through the process of lightening the inside of me because the inside of me was very numb and very dark because I was always chasing this ideal and I wasn't I wasn't I didn't feel worthy and I didn't feel that I deserved to be in that I guess body so healing my relationship with food took me above and beyond. And what I've learned from sharing my story is I think I learned that there are other things in my past that triggered me, like my volleyball coach, which I never thought about, but I learned that. And there are a lot of things in our past that trigger us and they're still in our subconscious that really we have to find and 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 kind of not just eliminate it but just allow it to be like this is what happened in the past and I'm going to move on because I deserve to move on um and then what is one of my biggest dreams or what is my biggest dream I think my biggest dream is to create a beautiful community for females to evolve and just feel empowered so that they can step into their purpose when it comes to healing their their relationship with food, healing their mindset, and just also using movement for energizing themselves and not punishment. 
Um, so creating that community would be more of a retreat style for me. I love to travel so much. It's such a big part of me. And I would love to take this beautiful community to different places of the world so that I can interact with different souls all around the world. And I think that would honestly be my biggest dream. So thank you so much for listening to my story. I hope you guys have an absolutely amazing today. And if you are struggling with anything that is within healing yourself with food and you might be scared to do it, you are so worth the healing and you deserve to heal and you have the power inside of you to heal. And thank you so much for listening. Have an amazing day. This is Seek the Joy podcast, the power of storytelling. Join us, share your story. For more information and to get involved, visit seekthejoypodcast.com. This series airs the third week of every month. And make sure to join us for Seek the Joy Tuesday. Until then, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your bravery. Thank you for your joy. Thank you for being here. And thank you for listening. Thank you.